Welcome to our second day of the Behavioral Economics Forum, uh, hosted by the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Markets, Risk, and Resilience. We're very excited to have you all back. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Uh, we're going to start off with a session on hope, aspirations, and agency, and this will be led uh, by Catherine Thomas from the University of Michigan. Uh, welcome, Catherine. Hi again, everyone. Just to reintroduce myself. Um, Catherine Thomas coming from the University of Michigan, uh, Department of Psychology and Organizational Studies. And I'm excited to share this session with uh, Nathan Jensen and Andres Moya. And together we'll be talking about aspirations, agency, and mental health, and um, the ways that these can be used to um, support poverty reduction. Um, and the last thing I wanted to note in, in starting is that what I'll show here is a lot of research uh, from an exploding, emerging area um, of study in development economics and in psychology. There's been really rapid growth in this area for over the last just even um, couple of years. So I'm really excited to share that with you. So we'll have about five points for this um, agenda for today. So the first thing that we'll talk about is what are psychosocial constraints? The second is how might these constraints undermine program impacts? And Nathan Jensen will take us through an empirical example of this. And then I'll talk about what are best bet solutions for boosting agency and aspirations. I'll talk about three examples in particular. And then Andres Moya will take us through a promising area for future research, which entails uh, mental health treatment. And he'll talk about that specifically in conflict affected areas. And then finally, um, I'll end with some takeaways as well as specific ways to integrate uh, these interventions into existing programs. Okay, so first, what are psychosocial constraints? They stem from the basis um, of the idea that poverty is multidimensional. So beyond financial scarcity, poverty often entails unpredictability and shocks in one's socio-ecological context, conflict and violence. Um, it's often associated with lower levels of education and access to education, vulnerability to predatory, um, predatory actors within one's community um, because of segregation and marginalization. It often entails limited opportunities, um, discrimination, social mar marginalization, as I said, and, and in turn, all of these features land on the individual and impose psychosocial constraints on individuals. So uh, constraints on their human capital and their social capital. So now what are psychosocial constraints? Poverty often entails due to factors like low returns to effort, no matter how much effort you put in, you don't get much out. This can um, uh, drive a lower sense of agency um, over one's fate. Um, you might not see many examples of uh, alternative futures in your environment, so that might drive down lower aspirations. You might experience greater stigma and discrimination from being reliant to some extent on other people. Um, are holding a low socioeconomic position. Again, due to marginalization and segregation, you might have limited social capital and networks, limited opportunities to people or context, um, context to people who could help you access new opportunities and resources. And all this together um, generally drives the greater rates of depression and stress that we see among lower income populations. Lower income populations compared to the highest um, quintile are about twice as likely to experience depression and common mental disorders like anxiety, um, postpartum depression. So why should we focus on psychosocial constraints and dedicate resources to this question? The first is that material approaches are often necessary but not sufficient, especially for reaching all parts of a population. And um, I'll turn it to Nathan soon to share research on that. And the second is that psychosocial constraints more generally for a broader population can reduce take up and effectiveness of programs. And more broadly, they have even been linked to economic mobility on their own through their effects on decision-making and behavior. 
So some behaviors that can be undermined by psychosocial constraints, um, stigma can drive lower take up of programs, um, lower self-efficacy can reduce effort and productivity, as well as lower engagement and performance and skills building. So in trainings that might be delivered or academic achievement and as well as um, behavior change. So uh, risk-taking behaviors and, and trying new things um, and lower aspirations can also drive down future-oriented investments, for instance, in savings and child education and productive assets. So now I'll turn it over to Nathan um, to present his work uh, from Kenya. Hi everybody, I'm, I'm Nathan Jensen at the University of Edinburgh. Um, as she loads this up, I'll just Let's do... say a few words. I think um, Catherine's done a pretty good job of setting the scene of why we might think that psychosocial constraints could limit the impacts of programming. So I'm going to look at a specific program and we'll sort of look, look at some of these constraints and try to understand the extent to which it impacts them. And then we're, we're going to take a second step and see if there's some indication that some psychosocial assets could be transferred between different individuals. This is work that, I'm, that we did with Gia Zhang, Michael Carter, and Lauren Krevet, Laurel Krev, Krovitz, sorry, all of who were at UC Davis at the time. I was at Ilry. Um, some of us have moved on now. Okay, so most of us should be familiar with uh, the standard graduation program. The idea is that often households are sort of locked into lower income or lower productivity activities, and they're locked in because they don't have access to some sort of assets. So the way graduation programs often work is they try to transfer tangible assets, often in the form of cash or assets, some sort of capital, and intangible assets around business skills, uh, training related to what, whichever the, the new occupation is going to be, as well as things like addressing some of these psychosocial constraints. The idea is that by addressing these constraints, particip participants can then move to higher income activities, and then when the program leaves, they've sort of quote unquote graduated from poverty so they, they can continue doing these activities. So they now have these newer, higher income options. There's quite a bit of evidence that these programs can have positive impacts on people. There's been multi-country studies, there's been sort of deep dive studies into certain locations. And we know we know that they work effectively. Our focus in, the, in this study is gonna be looking at the role of psychosocial constraints in determining who the programs hurt or who they help and who they don't help, I should say. Nobody's getting hurt. Then we're gonna look at, we're gonna sort of change gears and we're gonna look at spillovers from the program participants onto non-participants. And we find that there are financial spillovers. We ask the question, could some of those financial spillovers come from transfers of these intangible assets or psychosocial uh, assets? The program that we're looking at is called the Rural Entrepreneur Access Project, I'll call it REAP. And it's implemented by the NGO called the BOMA Project. On the right, there's some your yeah. On the right, there's there's some information I scraped from their their website, but they've been around for quite some time. They started in northern Kenya, and they're effectively always operating in these dryland areas. And so they've identified these dryland areas as often being quite marginalized. Um, other NGOs maybe aren't doing the same types of activities there. They started in Kenya, as I mentioned, that's in the dark red, and they're sort of scaling across. You can see the Sahel a bit. Uh, the, I should note the areas in yellow are not places that they're operating. That's places where they hope to operate soon, but they're operating in the, the orange and dark, dark red. The standard project is they use community-based targeting to identify the poorest women in communities that, that they're going to operate in. This is usually about the lowest half of the women, if not more. The eligible women then form three-person business groups. So this is a bit of innovation on their side. They wanted to make sure that the assets that were transferred to the women, the, the hard assets, the tangible assets, weren't somehow co-opted co by the family members. So by having a three-person business, it's not owned by any one person, and it makes it harder for other people in the family to come sort of draw down some of those assets. The program is usually about 24 months. It starts with business skill training, and then the participants will come up with a business plan with a mentor. And so just like other graduation programs, there's a lot of footprint on the ground. There's a mentor that's meeting with people weekly and then monthly. They receive a cash grant at around three months and around six months, they get a second smaller grant if the business is going well. Eventually, the businesses are grouped into savings groups. So this is like a Roscoe or Merigrown style savings group. And this is just 
three, four, five businesses will come together, and then they, they can use those savings group to lend money out to their peers or to take it on to sort of expand their business. They do receive small monthly grants during the program. So our study, we worked with uh, BOMA to identify eligible women in 88 Manyatas of Northern Kenya. This was an area where they had been intending to, to move into, but had not yet. So they haven't been in Northern Samburu, which is the county in green there. They hadn't been in that area, but they were, they're intending to. They're actually saving it aside for impact evaluation. So it's good timing on our side. We selected a subsample of the REAP eligible women. So all of the women in the study were REAP eligible. And we allocated that subsample to treatment and control group. The third group, which is about half the women, then went into this group that we call the, the REAP pool. The reason we did that is because then as we rolled women into the program, we would select one of our treatment women, and then she had to identify two people to start a business with. And we didn't want her grabbing from our control group, and we didn't want her to grab from our other treated group because that would reduce our power. So you have three different groups. We're only studying two of them. Uh, the project timeline is down at the bottom. We did a baseline in 2018 before any reprogramming started. Midline at 2020, end line at 2022. Women are rolled in wave after wave in the communities. So they wanted their mentors to work sort of across space in all the communities at once. But some, so they have limited bandwidth, so they can only start several businesses at a time in each community, as opposed to sort of knocking down one community and then going to the next and the next. They do this because, of course, communities are, why, why are you treating that community not over here? So they want them sort of operating in all these communities. We worked with BOMA, and we'll come, come back to this later, but to adjust the number of businesses that were rolled in each wave. And what this means that by, by 2020, during our midline survey, some of the communities had had many businesses started early on in wave one. So there's many other people around our control group that were treated. And in some of the communities, there weren't many other people treated. By the end, at Edline, all of the communities should have had about 20 to 30% of their women treated. So the saturation sort of equals out by the end. But by midline, we have a lot of variation that we take advantage of. First step is just to look at the average treatment effects. So this would be sort of your normal impact evaluation. Again, we're using baseline and midline data. The outcome is from midline. That's our Y1 on the, on the left. We're gonna control for baseline. And then we're gonna interact treatment with the wave that the women was enrolled in. At midline, if you're in wave one, you had just graduated. If you're in wave two, you would have started your business and you would have ran it for about 12 months by the time midline. So you've mostly gone through the programming. Wave three and four women are just sort of starting out. And the only reason to aggregate them is to make the discussion easier, honestly. So we disaggregate them in the study and you can look at them that way if you like. The three outcomes that we look at throughout the study are, are on the left there. So the first business assets. Now remember, if you're a participant in the program, the program literally transfers about $100 to you. It transfers $300 to a group of three women. So we see on top of that $100, there's about another $90 treatment effect. The baseline values are listed down below. And so you can see that's still a pretty, pretty large effect. For ways one and two, again, looking at household income, we see that there's a nice boost of about 10%, a little bit more over baseline. And savings is a huge boost. And remember, there was some facilitation of savings, but the program did not reallocate any money into savings. It was totally from the women's businesses where they're, they're putting their revenue. Waves three and four, you can see it's the same stories there, but of course they haven't had as much time to sort of generate the income that we're. I said, we're gonna look at heterogeneity and impacts by depression. We use this thing called the CC, CSD10 score as an indicator that, that somebody could be highly depressed basically a score of the number of depressive symptoms and how severe they are. The distributions on the right, the score could run from zero to 30. Uh, our distribution is similar to other distributions. It's a, it's a metric that's been verified in Africa and other low-income settings. We're gonna use a threshold of 12 to indicate people with a lot of depressive symptoms. It's a little bit higher than what other um, projects have used, but we're looking for very sort of people that we know are expressing a lot of depressive symptoms. So we decided to be conservative. To look at the different groups now, I mean, basically we're gonna look at the impacts on four different groups, depressed people in wave one, not depressed, everybody is sorry, the depressed status is determined at baseline. So we're not updating that. So it's not the treatment effect on depressed, we're holding constant if you were depressed or if you 
went beyond that threshold during baseline. And we'll look at the impacts across these four groups. If you're in wave one and two, and were you depressed at baseline or were you not? I think you saw this table um, yesterday as well. And the story here is that if you're not depressed, yeah, your impacts are larger than the average impacts were estimated before, of course, um, but still quite consistent with what we were seeing in the earlier table. And if you were depressed, things aren't looking so, so shiny. You can see that they've drawn down some of those $100 that were given to them as part of their business. It's effectively no impact on their um, income. There is some impact on their savings. So it does seem like the savings channel is continuing to work with these, these participants. I should notice that there's a lot of lockbox techno lock technology happening here. So there's you know, the, the teaching of how to account for the books, how to, you know, how you should agree as a group, how money is put into those groups. And so some of those decisions are going to be made as a group, not as an individual. And here we're looking at depression at the individual level. So it could be that the group's still managing to operate quite well, but you have individuals that are depressed. So now switching gears to spillovers. To do this, we're first going to test for the impact of spillovers on the, on the control group financially. We expect that those to be more easily observed, I'll say. And then when we find those, which we do find, then we're going to say, OK, is it possible that the transfer of these intangible assets or psychosocial assets could have been part of the reason or part of the driving force behind them? I think we can think of a lot of ways that there could be spillovers. And of course, between the treaty groups, there could be spillovers too, right? You could have economies of scale between businesses or more competition between businesses. From the non-treated, you could also have redistribution of income, of course. Um, but you could also have these intangible tra um, transfers, like business skills. I mean, you can imagine teaching your friend the business skills that you learned in the treatment. Again, we have the ratio of women that are rolled each way very exogenously. We have this, this indicator that's, this is S, so that's an indicator of saturation. And this accounts for both the duration of other people treated around you and the density. Because some of the women could be in a community where everybody was treated, but it just happened in wave three, for example, where most, a lot of women were treated. So you wouldn't have had much time for spillovers. And some of the women had, were in communities where many people were treated in wave one, so you'd always be bumping into people that had been treated. Our indicator runs from, zero to 0.6, but those on the edges are really sort of small, small numbers issues. Most of, the, most of the communities are in the middle and the average is 0.2. So you can just remember 0.2 moving forward. It's kind of hard to interpret and you don't really need to. It's just, that's the variable. So we can look at the, the spillovers of treatment onto the control using the saturation, this variation saturation, so because it's identification. In the first column, you see that there is some impact on the control women around business assets, which is really interesting because I would have guessed that the impact would have been related to savings to begin with, because now there's new savings groups in your community, and maybe you could join those savings group and you would sort of pick that up. But at the business asset side, it's pretty interesting. So you're seeing people, other people start businesses, and apparently you're investing more in business assets. Uh, the, other, the other story here is that if you look at treatments one and two, between zero saturation and mean saturation, we're kind of imputing this, right? So we don't really have many communities with zero saturation. We're using an interaction and we can say, okay, what if saturation is zero? What does it look like? What if it's at the mean? What does it look like? Of course, we could impute it for, for other values as well. We see that there does seem to be some competition. The more other businesses there are in your community, it appears as though the, the impacts reduce a little bit. That's something for BOMA to consider, um, but it's not sort of the main story here. So now we'd like to know what could drive this, this change to business assets and other things. And what we're, gonna, what we're thinking about here is our things like adaptive preferences. The story about sour grapes that we heard about several times yesterday. Can seeing your neighbor start a successful business now make it feel like, oh, that's something I could do as well? Does it seem more achievable, more desirable? We use this Cantrell scale. It's used by other programming. To think about people's beliefs about the future and how desirable it is to move up standards of living. The standards of living are all sort of socially, or sorry, communally determined. We talked with people, what are the, the normal standards of living in your area? How do we characterize them? And then during the survey, we would ask people, what, where do you fall on this, on this ladder of life, as, as Michael called it, or these, these different standards of living? How important would it be for you to move up to another to a further standard of living, to increase your standard of living. 
And you can think about this like from an economic side is basically what's the curvature of your utility function, right? If it's quite flat, it's not very important for you to move up to a new standard of living. If still quite curved, you're, you're happier to, to have more wealth. And we do the very similar regressions here again. The first thing we're gonna look is did the treatment effect have, did the treatment have any impact on the treated desire to move to rung three or rung four? And the earlier, uh, well, I can't go back, but most of these women, of course, are starting off in, in standard of living one or two because they're the poor or the ultra poor. We saw that for waves one and two and waves three and four, there does seem to be an increase in the desirability of moving up. And then sort of more importantly, what is the impact on the control? We see that, again, there's sort of some indication we're clearly not very well powered to be thinking about these things or examining these, these things closely. But the control women are reporting some increase in their like in their desirability of moving to wave four, at least a bit for wave three. So the takeaway, REAP has a positive impact on the desirability of moving up to further waves amongst the treated. And there's some indication, we'll call it quite weak indication, um, that some of the, that sort of desirability is spilling over onto the non-treated. So I'll just close with these, re-summarizing the points. REAP clearly has a positive impact on, on average on its participants, but it's a much smaller impact um, amongst those with depressive symptoms. And we can see that there's some mechanisms within REAP itself that helps those impacts sort of take place among savings, but not other, other areas. It's clear that some participants face these psychosocial constraints that are limiting REAP's, REAP's effectiveness. I think the question hopefully we'll talk about more during the session is how should organizations like BOMA respond to these findings? It's not clear what they should do, but there, there should be some other treatment for women that are coming in depressed and screening. We still want to, of course, these are going to be the most vulnerable women. So this is within the objectives of BOMA to, to still work with these women. So how should they do that? The second is that there's negative spillovers between businesses and positive spillovers on the non-treated individuals. So anybody thinking about returns on investment or total pro program effects really has to be aware of this because, of course, all of these estimates are going to be biased. They're biased on what is the treatment effect if you don't control for saturation and spillovers. They're also biased in the total program effect because you actually help the control group as well, and you want to include that in your estimates. Of course, Bowman needs to consider these spillovers when they're setting their saturation targets. What is their objective? Is it to help the treated or is it to help the community? And then finally, are there strategies for increasing the positive and reducing the negative spillovers? And I think the, the thing about business savings is it shows us there's, there are some strategies for that. Um, I'll close with that. Thank you. All right. I, I mean, I'm just uh, wondering, so given what we know about just stressors generally and uh, the, the role that stress has in not just women, but men, uh, people who are disadvantaged in, in many respects, uh, as we find with poverty, this is really a surprising finding. I mean, it's uh, to be expected, right? That that stressors uh, will have these kinds of impacts that we're we're seeing here. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if you looked at any methodologies uh, that that just take a look at okay, how many stressors are there, and uh, and. and what our particular uh, subject might be exposed to in terms of those stressors and, and how those are uh, related to the findings here. I'm, I'm, it, it seems to be kind of uh, almost predictable really what you're describing. And I'm, I'm wondering if other methodologies could be used as well and just as predictable, predictably. Yeah, um, good question. I, I don't know. I definitely, I cannot answer all of those questions myself, but hopefully hopefully the, the speakers following me will answer some of them. I can say it's certainly predictable that there's going to be heterogeneity and impacts and that there's going to be characteristics of individuals that, that cause that. Um, I think up until recently, at least for me, much of the work that I've been surrounded by has, has examined um, more uh, tangible or more easily observed reasons for that heterogeneity and impact. So people ask questions like, okay, do they have, do they have any education coming to the program? Do they have, you know, how many livestock do they have? Those sorts of things. 
Um, but at least in my experience, we, we haven't been putting much effort into understanding the roles of these other sort of uh, psychosocial constraints. Having identified them, it doesn't mean at this point that, that they are the most important, right? So we could think about that there, there could be other things that are driving this heterogeneity as well, and there, there almost certainly is. I think the next, the sort of the next step in the research is to understand how important these things are. And then thinking back to some of the discussions yesterday, what, is, what are the cost effectiveness of addressing some of these constraints? It's probably a lot easier to, well, I think, I think we'll hear that it's, it can be quite easy to impact people's aspirations or quite low cost at least, um, compared to other things like, you know, edu changing the education of somebody actually can, can be very expensive and can take a long time. I think that's sort of the direction that, that this will go in the future. Um, right now, as far as understanding which are the different stressors, I don't, I'm sure people are studying that. And so maybe we'll hear more about that later. So that's, yeah, there we go. Well, you're, you've led into the next speaker very nicely. Thank you. Um, and also to answer, to give another answer to that question, um, in the work that I'll actually show you next, we did not find heterogeneity by baseline um, mental distress. So I think that it's still an open question. Um, Andres Moya will also talk about a dose response relationship between distress and other economic outcomes. So I think more research is needed. One of the reasons that I'm not putting mental health as one of these three best bets is for this reason, which is that the evidence is still coming in and it's currently mixed on um, whether we can effectively address mental health um, with our cur current tools, whether it's predictably positive effects and whether they actually affect program outcomes. That has also not been quite established, even though we've seen many trials of mental health and low-income contexts. Okay, so now I'll talk to you about what I see as three best bet solutions for boosting aspirations and agency to better support participants and increase program impacts. Here we have some evidence on increasing program impacts and complementarities there. Um, and just, again, I'll uh, emphasize that aspirations and agency, these are both related to mental health. And you'll see, if you look at the CESD, um, that Nathan was just mentioning, that they include questions about aspirations, hope, and agency. Um, so these are components, subcomponents. They're kind of more precise psychological targets. And we know low-cost, light, um, low cost light touch ways to intervene on them. So that's what I'm showing you next. Okay, so the first best bet is to build aspirations and agency through empowering inclusive narratives. I will show you evidence on this point, but I'll also just say that it's probably a best practice um, so the psychological, psychosocial constraint that we're facing here is that aid itself, receiving help from others, can be psychologically threatening and reinforce the stigma of poverty. So um, aid can implicitly or explicitly convey that recipients are helpless or lesser than. So these are some examples um, that I've seen out in the world um, of explicitly conveying that. And I think these programs have the best of intentions um, and they're probably often oriented towards donors rather than recipients. However, they still get conveyed to recipients. I actually did um, a lit review of the 30 top cash transfer programs in Africa and found that this type of deficit-oriented um, narrative conveying recipients' helplessness, um, low agency, and low social position um, it was present 97% of the time. So I would say that this is actually the default. Um, and that's a picture that I actually took in the middle. That's that's real. <laughs> um, okay, so let me tell you about one lab experiment, which again, is not the best evidence, but some indication uh, from Kenya that I ran. So this in the study, we gave 565 low-income individuals in Kibera and Kalangbari, um, informal settlements in Nairobi. We gave them about um, 400 shillings, so two days wages. And then we randomly assign them to one of three aid organization narratives. Poverty alleviation, individual empowerment, or community empowerment narratives. Very face valid um, in terms of what we're trying to convey here. So the first group um, heard that they were receiving cash from the poverty alleviation, alleviation organization, uh, whose goal is to alleviate poverty and reduce financial hardship among the poor. So that's that deficit-focused narrative that conveys um, helplessness and, and low agency. And it ends with helping um, people meet their basic needs. 
The second one was an individual empowerment organization whose goal is to enable individuals to pursue personal goals and become more financially independent. So I situate this as an independent agency narrative um, talking about self-reliance and autonomy. And I often see this, I actually drafted part of this of Western um, organizations in Nairobi on their um, scripts that they say um, to recipients. And the third is a community empowerment narrative. So the goal of this organization is to enable people to support those they care about and help communities grow together. And you see this with some organizations, for instance, Shafco, Shining Hope for Communities in Kibera. Uh, it's a really big nonprofit. Um, and that's a local NGO uh, conveying more interdependent agency. So being responsive to social coordination and collective advancement. And this we consider to be uh, more culturally attuned based on formative data on people's self controls whether they see themselves as more independent, individualistic, or collectivistic and interdependent. So our primary outcome was this behavior of interest in building business skills. So we gave participants the choice to watch two uh, videos at the end of the survey, at the end of the experiment. Uh, four were leisure videos like Nollywood film trailers and comedy, and two were business skills building videos that we had made for the study, like financing business expansion, calculating profit. And what we see is that community empowerment organization significantly increases skills building, interest in skill and building business skills. Um, and the poverty alleviation organization was significantly lower than that, that it led to the significantly um, least effective effects and the individual empowerment fell in between. So this shows some kind of causal evidence that these narratives affect behavior, even though they're small effects. We also looked at recipients' psychological experience of aid. So first, let's look at their self-efficacy and consider this a measure of agency. Again, we see that that poverty alleviation narrative leads to the lowest effects on self-efficacy, kind of undermining, you say undermining people's self-efficacy to a viable alternative, which is uh, positioning them as empowered agents. Um, and both empowerment uh, narratives conveyed goals and agency. So we see similar effects there. Next, we look at perceived stigma. So for instance, how much do you feel that other people make negative judgments about you based on your economic status? And again, we see the worst effects with the poverty alleviation one, and that's significantly reduced only in the community empowerment condition. Um, and here we think that that's in part because it is really responsive to what's socially valued in this context or the values that are resonant. This is a, is a methodological aside because from our conversation yesterday, I thought it might be useful for how you actually enact behavioral science and think about different psychosocial approaches. So this is a local forecasting methodology. We gave um, people from this population that we were targeting um, brief descriptions of our narrative. Then we asked them uh, to predict a very specific behavioral outcome. So we asked out of 10 people who were told this narrative, how many do you guess picked one of the business videos compared to the non-business videos as the one they were most interested to watch? And we repeated this in an A-B fashion um, for each aid narrative. And we found that they predicted the pattern, exactly predicted the pattern of results. Um, so putting that community empowerment at top and poverty alleviation at the bottom and the individual in between. And there's a lot more work on this local forecasting methodology that's now out um, that I encourage you to look at. Okay, so here we saw that the community empowerment is the more recommended route for narratives than the poverty alleviation one. This has actually just recently been replicated in the US and among a very large sample in a field experiment, um, looking at the take up of food stamps, CalFresh in California. And it also showed that the poverty, uh, community empowerment one reduced stigma as well as increased uh, food stamps. So this is for lower income populations. So here, I know the US is different from Kenya, um, but consistently we find more interdependent self construals among lower income populations. Another study um, by Elizabeth Linos and colleagues found that destigmatizing um, housing assistance by emphasizing it's, it's not your fault that um, you are struggling financially versus emphasizing neediness increased take up of housing assistance. Another way to do this is a little bit more intensive, just prompting um, people, participants to reflect on successful personal experiences and personal values. 
which has been shown to increase take up of welfare program info and success and reemployment um, in the US and field experiments. And then another alternative here in the context of education is prompting Middle Eastern and African refugees to reflect on how the, their experiences as, as being refugees help them acquire skills for success, increase their academic course completion. So I know that these are from the US, um, but I, I think that we can probably agree that emphasizing participants' agency is something that would be useful in most places compared to their neediness and low social position. So the pitfall here, um, I'll, I want to give a pitfall for each um, best bet that I provide. So the first is to, to mitigate victim blaming. You don't want to overemphasize agency because that can get you back into kind of a bootstraps mentality and perpetuate stigma. So to uh, avoid that, you can acknowledge structural reasons, reasons for poverty in addition to individuals' agency going forward to use the program well in a very narrow sense. So at a very high level, the takeaway here is to communicate that program participants are seen by the organization, by the institution, by society as capable, resourceful agents rather than helpless, needy beneficiaries. Okay, the second best bet is uh, building aspirations and agency through role models and visualization exercises. So this builds on this, I, the psychosocial constraint that um, is limited exposure to different life paths and low hope for change. So Daniela Sarah has actually done, so Dean was talking yesterday about uh, multiple points of evidence. So Daniela Sarah has actually just put out a review piece on role models in low-income country contexts um, and found positive effects for eight out of 10 RCTs, field experiments uh, for this approach. The evidence is basis building. As I said, this, this review doesn't even include several that have been come out in the last uh, year or two. So to give you an example of this, I'll return to that example that I started sharing yesterday, which is an RCT of the Sahel Adaptive Social Protection Program in which we were able to vary different, different designs of the national safety net program. So this is a general description of the RCT design. Won't go through it all again, but just to share that, to make the connection to Nathan's presentation, that first package that included business training savings plus the capital package is what we consider to be like the graduation model that, that he was showing. That's kind of our, our benchmark. And to that, we added two um, lesser tested psychosocial innovations um, to add to see if there's complementarities with these economic material approaches. So the first was a community film event, which was a role modeling event followed by community discussion. So I, as I promised, oh, this was everything together. Okay. It's, a, it's a graduation model versus substituting out the cash asset for the two psychosocial interventions, and then the full package puts it all together. Yeah. Okay, so here we had this community film event um, of the story of a woman named Amina who models the counter-normative behavior of women's entrepreneurship. This is a realistic fiction in contrast to some of the other studies that are in this space. Some are um, positive deviance, so showing success stories from people in your context. Some are movies, which I'll show you in a second. And then this is um, carefully scripted realistic fiction um, that we tried to blend the two, basically. Um, worked with a Senegalese uh, filmmaker to make this movie. And I said I'd share some clips of this. So here you'll see that this whole program was designed to be responsive to climate shocks in this region and to um, support women in diversifying sources of income. So I'll show you kind of the start and the end of this 20 minute film. Hoping it works. Where is it? Niger. Yeah, sorry. Oh, it's just an image, it looks like. Can I? Just the, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, here, let's just. Oh, just go to that. Just, um, no, it's not the movie. It's just an image of it. Okay, there's Vimeo right there. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's see if we can go full screen. Mm -hmm. Great. Now you can control how much we want. I 
ay gida ay no kun kan cinji ne niya ay kun si bar mara ya kina ga isi ba halir gin kun zan kai lokol an nika ay gola sabo dinga ma ay koy galluno an bara ay gido nya fu sin fu an gido hankara ne da ay wo dai gado aram mai no dama halaran gani aram dira wo dai sin ni ay mu koy gidi nyan ayyan han ba gari inge wo isi gen da bari aram bai zag mai no gani ta hari bare gani mo dola an bare han fu habu koyan bon dai ne ka saban da wai bare gon ga mage ne ga ay di mo mago din go gade in ga tikai mu sinti ngi dwe mage zan ay konde habu ay gi dwe waga bi zan konde habu kal mo so sai sinti ngi dwe dalai zan ga dan kan bu gandi alai sinti ngi dwe alman yan ga dai ai sabe inya so then she and her husband go on to face some interpersonal and economic challenges resolve them and she starts um a restaurant herself and then also um is able to support her husband in starting a solar charging business and then i'll show you the clip at the end where she shares back with women in her savings group what she's learned adin kai go gadu worau chirara ai gadu wa rib kai da din ai ga fai ihinka ai mai jera dan ai asusora gajisi mata kan inne dama ga bar mai furu yadin no irhima irbun boda in mu kokari ga da bar mai bar mai Yeah, you said it's a minute. Yeah, we're just praying. Can we just clarify? I don't know. Oh, I think we need to see. Okay. We have to look through. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Just getting a refresher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Almost there. All right. So then this is a little bit different from the other role model interventions. We actually follow this by a scripted community discussion, guided community discussion to relate, prompting the audience to relate the film to community values and to build consensus and supporting new behaviors. So everybody's supporting the women and their success in the program. And this was targeted to the lower lowest income households within a village. So we're really trying to engage everybody in supporting the women. So now we will look at impacts on um, household poverty at two years. So in the control condition, we see that households are living on about $1.70 per person per day. However, this significantly increases um, in that capital condition, we included the business training, savings groups, and cash transfer, and a few other material supports. And remember that cash grant was sizable. Um, it was about 80% of a person's annual consumption. And we achieved similar impacts with the psychosocial um, intervention. With those, they just substituted out the cash grant with those two psychosocial, light touch psychosocial interventions. So the movie and life skills training, so I'll show you next. And then finally, putting it all together in this full package, we showed that had significantly positive effects compared to both the control and the capital condition, which means that there's marginal benefit to adding those psychosocial conditions. We also find um, positive impacts of all conditions on food security. So um, all conditions alike reduced extreme um, food insecurity. So going a day without food, for instance, um, by 20%. Now, if we think about the perspective of the implementer, the government, let's look at cost effectiveness. So what we find here is that um, the, psychosocial the psychosocial package achieved similar impacts, but it did so at a fraction of the cost, making it um, significantly more cost effective than the capital package. The full package was also um, highly cost effective and more so than the capital package. These are actually some of the largest uh, benefit to cost ratios documented in this literature on graduation uh, programs to date. Okay, so we have that example. But the issue was that we had many components in this intervention. So let me show you some where we just look at the effects of role model interventions. So this is uh, a video documentary of local success stories um, in Ethiopia, which found that this increased investment in child education and agriculture even five years later after showing a kind of 
uh, four um, success videos in community settings. Another uh, RCT in Uganda tested the effect of this movie called Queen of Kotwe, and they did it right before, within a few weeks to a month before national exams. And they found that this increased educational performance um, on that national exam, especially for math, and it decreased, um, increased girls' educational attainment down the line. Another um, way that you can achieve a similar effect is not by showing role, role models, but um, prompting people to visualize their own futures and different life paths. So these are visualization exercises. So aspirations, visualization, and goal planning workshops um, were found to cost effectively increase investments, savings, and living standards in Kenya. So reducing poverty in particularly cost effective ways. And they compared this actually to a cash transfer, which achieved higher impacts, but less cost effectiveness. This has even been used in the health domain. So visualizing alternative, healthier futures has been found to increase the use of chlorine, um, reduce childhood diarrhea, and increase savings. So this is a particularly innovative case of this um, type of exercise. And then lastly, teaching visualization as a skill has been shown to increase entrepreneurial success and savings in Colombia. Very important pitfall here is that aspirations should not be conveyed to be too high, unrealistic, or unrelatable. So there are empirical examples of where this backfires if you do that. So the main uh, takeaway here is to show participants that change is possible and engage them in envisioning optimistic but realistic futures. And this is you know, particularly true in the case where we're providing them new resources, um, that it is a chance to update your beliefs because you do have a new context, um, new uh, resources that are available. Okay, so the third best bet, final one, is building aspirations and agency through life skills trainings and goal setting in particular. What I've just shown you um, are more lighter touch, low cost ways to implement psychosocial interventions. This one's a bit more intensive, but still not that intensive even compared to mental health interventions, for instance. So this addresses the psychosocial constraint of limited access to education, which um, Heckman and others find builds soft skills and human capital. So I'll return to this example from Niger and focus on the second psychosocial intervention, which was the one week life skills training. That was led by an organization in Benin um, and they teach skills like goal setting, decision making, problem solving. So those all relate to, I would cluster under goal setting and goal pursuit strategies. And then they also taught things like interpersonal communication. So I won't go back into the results, you know the results, but just to show that that, that was part of this highly cost-effective anti-poverty uh, program. I actually, to kind of causally identify the effects of the goal-setting interventions, I uh, did a, an embedded experiment where I gave a one-session follow-up that was specifically focused on goal-setting and initiative exercises. Um, and I found that that further increased the economic outcomes, showing kind of a causal relationship there. Um, one thing that I won't get into, but that I think is very important, I'll say as a pitfall, is that I actually varied whether these, like I did in Kenya, um, whether these were more independent or interdependent oriented, so more personal initiative or what I'm calling interpersonal initiative, and found that only the interpersonal initiative showed these positive effects down the line. The personal initiative one did not. Um, other studies have found, so I'll just give you a, a set of other studies um, as examples, two-day life skills workshop, in Rwanda uh, with women was found to um, increase their income. Nine session training to build self-efficacy, which you can vaguely see here on the right, um, increased women's employment in India. So what this curriculum has is a discussion of women's strengths, their talents, their goals, goal planning, problem solving, and putting it all together. So that's what that says on the right. And then personal initiative training has been found to outperform traditional business training in Togo, and they replicated positive effects of personal initiative training among entrepreneurial types. Um, they've done this in Togo and other places. So what this is doing is emphasizing self-startingness, uh, future orientation, and persistent proactive mindset. Um, and so we consider these as being really, you know, related to goal setting and initiative. Um, this, I think, particularly works with entrepreneurial types who are already inclined to have that sort of mindset as opposed to rural low-income women who might not be very entrepreneurial inclined towards that. So I, that's why there's a distinction um, between what I showed earlier in this. Okay, so the pitfall here is not tailoring these interventions to socioeconomic and cultural context can 
limit their effectiveness. And there's several other uh, studies of that in addition to the one I shared. So the main takeaway here is to teach goal setting and initiative as key life skills as a component add-on if possible. And with that, I will turn it over back to, uh, to Andres Moya and see you at the end. Um, that the question was about poverty porn and whether it's actually effective for recruiting donations, for instance, and what we need to do to change it. Um, so we actually had a, our third study in this paper is testing among donors in the US. And we find that there's no effect of any narrative actually um, on affecting donations. And so I think that it might potentially, might speculate, the knowledge provides a speculation, which is that I think in the 90s and 80s, when you know just the aid industry was starting up, and there's a lot of, you know, ads for it. I think that just to like shock people into caring, I think that's what was happening. I think we maybe needed that, um, but now it's kind of outlived its usefulness and is reinforcing um, negative narratives. And um, in terms of making long-term change to more empowerment-oriented um, narratives for recipients, I, I hope that. Uh, talking about research and how <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm actually, you know, writing blogs on why we should not use the term the poor and and things like this. And so I'm hoping that we can start to have conversations among us and realize that it's counterproductive. It's like empirically counterproductive. It's kind of probably ethically counterproductive and problematic. So um, I'm hoping that we can all take that on as a challenge. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. Before... Thanks. Um... You know, I, I listen to you speak and, and even the video, and uh, so I um, kind of am leaning even more against the idea of a cash transfer at all, and the idea of um, building organically from top bottom up, you know, a penny into the Village Savings and Loan Association. It takes longer, but it's more empowered. Um, it, do you reach a similar similar conclusion that the cash transfer may be so disempowering that it's kind of productive? Thank you. That's um, that was, I think, a question. I was just talking to Dean Carlin about this last night. That yes, we thought that was going to happen in the early days of cash transfers. That it could potentially be disempowering, but at this point, um, multiple studies have shown that it increases mental health, that it increases sense of agency, can increase aspirations. Um, it can have, uh, he was just showing a, net, a meta-analysis on positive effects, significantly positive effects on labor productivity. So I don't think that it's disempowering um, to provide cash at the end of, based on that empirical evidence. Um, and I am in favor of complementary approaches in general, because I think that um, psycho psychological solutions will take root best if they have what I, we call fertile soil, meaning um, we take a seed and soil approach, we want to plant a seed of change, but we want a fer fertile soil to nurture that change, to carry it forward. People might not be able to maintain high aspirations if they don't see anything changing. So cash can allow for context to be more supportive of change. So my takeaway is complementary approaches. Thank you so much, Catherine. We have one more question from online. I'm sorry, Andres. I'm sorry you're having to wait extra so long, but this is so rich for our USA staff. So from Osme online, were there gender differences in best bet one experiment in Kenya in R1 and R2 treatment outcomes? Thank you. Um, I yes, sir, sorry, were there gender differences in the um study one in Kenya on um community versus individual empowerment versus poverty alleviation? We did not find that. I always get that question. And we did not find that, actually. Um, we found no gender differences. In the Niger example, I don't, it's only women, so I can't speak to that. However, from the cultural psychological literature, if you're thinking this is kind of based in culture, we don't find gender differences as much on cultural values. So um, the differences between countries are much larger than the differences between genders within countries. So I would still do the same approach for men as for women. Although what respect means and who you're respecting and kind of what the hierarchical structure is in a society, I'd probably vary that for men and women, but I would still base it in respect, social harmony and generosity, like we saw in the Niger example and in the Kenya example, thinking about collective advancement and social coordination. I think that's, I hope that's where that question was going. I'm not exactly sure, but I hope I answered that. Thank you.
Great. So, um, how do I? There, ah, here. Right. Yeah. So thank you so much for, for being here or on Zoom. I'm Andres Moya from Universidad de Los Andes and, and to me as a pego, I'm gonna be talking, I'm gonna be zooming in on a very specific context. It's conflict of like settings. I'm gonna be talking about Colombia. And within these settings, I'm gonna uh, highlight the key connection of psychological strains and specifically mental health and trauma and why it matters for early child development. And just a, as, a, as a brief introduction or motivation, we're seeing a surge in conflict and displacement across the world. Uh, approximately 25% of the population worldwide lives in a setting that has been affected by armed conflict. We've seen the increase in uh, forcibly displaced uh, persons in the last decade. It's 115 million people that have been uh, uprooted and displaced uh, recently. And we see this in the news. We see Gaza, we see Sudan, we see Ukraine, we see Venezuela. In a very short period of time, millions of people being displaced. And this, this topic has attracted a lot of uh, uh, research and, and, and interest from uh, agencies, programming, uh, again, research uh, in economics and in other disciplines. We know, for instance, that uh, conflict and displacement can drive populations into chronic poverty. But we also know that it has uh, men severe mental health effects and it can affect early child development. However, uh, when we look at programming, we look at resources, we look at research, mental health and early child development have been relatively neglected within this area of work. So in this talk, I want to briefly highlight why mental health, specifically psychological trauma, can be a psychological constraint for early child development, why we need to uh, pay attention to caregivers' mental health in order to protect uh, young children that are affected by these settings. And I'm going to provide uh, some sort of hope with uh, uh, the experience and, and evidence from this program that we created called Semilla de Apego, which is like a seed for a healthy uh, child-parent attachment. And I'm gonna be focusing on Colombia uh, for one reason, because this is where, I, where I'm from and where I work, uh, but the context of Colombia is interesting for a couple of reasons. Why we've, uh, one, we've experienced uh, protracted conflict for nearly 70 years. Uh, currently, 20% of the population in Colombia has been displaced. And this includes 8.6 million internally displaced persons by conflict. But it also includes uh, almost 3 million Venezuelan refugees who have uh, arrived in the past five years uh, fleeing from socioeconomic crisis in Venezuela. Right? And in the map in the, in, in, in the left, it's highlighting just kind of the intensity of displacement across municipalities, just to picture that displacement and conflict have been happening pretty much all over uh, the country. The Colombian case is also interesting for another reason, and this is because we have very comprehensive set of legal frameworks, policy frameworks, programming. 20 years ago, the Constitutional Court in Colombia established a, a sentence that obligated the government to provide special protection to IDPs, design specific programs to IDPs to help them move out of poverty. Uh, in 2011, the government, the, the Colombian Senate actually passed what's called the Victims' Law, and maybe we now go to the narrative that you were mentioning. So why the Victims' Law, and what does this create kind of like in the minds of, of many of those victims? And as a result, we have uh, comprehensive programming in terms of humanitarian assistance, inclusion with priority to the social protection system. We have reparations, and we have uh, a lot of research documenting the impacts of these programs. And yet, despite all this massive resources, legal frameworks, IDPs and refugees in general in Colombia are extremely poor. So 60% uh, of IDPs are poor, 50% of refugees are poor. And this, as the figure uh, in your left is highlighting, is way above the, um, the national averages. Let's go. So of course, one side of the, like one perspective is, well, how would the poverty rates be if we didn't have these set of programming and policies and resources? But the other side of the question is, well, Maybe we're missing something. Maybe we're missing something in terms of how these programs are designed and implemented and how they're maybe failing to help IDPs recover and move out of poverty by themselves in a sustainable way. And what I've been doing in the last uh, the last 10 years or, or maybe in so uh, um, the last 15 years is trying to understand uh, kind of like a missing link and it's paying attention to mental health. In general, we know worldwide that uh, in conflict-affected settings, 
20% of the population are at risk of mental health problems. In Colombia, for instance, in data that we collected uh, some time ago, we highlight that uh, 27 to 35% of IDPs are at risk of developing severe anxiety and depression disorders. And maybe going and connecting to Mark's question uh, to the first presentation, we see that there is a dose response relation. And this is what the figure on your right is highlighting. Uh, a more severe exposure to conflict or more recent experience, uh, exposure to conflict is associated with a higher, uh, higher symptoms of mental health problems. And there's research that I'm not going to uh, be able to talk too much about this that highlights that these psychological constraints matter for socioeconomic trajectories and also for hope. In work that we conducted with Michael uh, some years ago, we showed that a more severe conflict leading to uh, worse mental health outcomes is associated with pessimistic expectations of upward mobility. So hopeless expectations of upward mobility. And here we were also using uh, kind of the ladder of life that Nathan was showing you before. And in a different uh, piece, we also show that uh, youth that have mental health problems have actually worse employment and income trajectories. And here we also document this those response relationship, right? So this is just to say that at least in these contexts of conflict, uh, of conflict and displacement, the psychological constraints actually emerge endogenously as a response to the adverse adversity to the trauma that these populations are experiencing. But then what's happening with young children? What's happening with young children that are born and raised in these conflict affected settings? And when we, what I'm going to highlight next in the, in the, in the few uh, slides that follow is actually kind of summarized by this picture by uh, the famous photographer in Colombia uh, called um, oh, his last name is Abad. So we know from a lot of work that has been uh, happening in the last 20 years, uh, the signs of early childhood, that early childhood is uh, the most unique stage in our life. We know that it's the moment where there is the most rapid brain development, the development of brain architecture. In the first three years of life, one million neuronal connections, synapses, are formed every second. And this lays the basis for uh, physical and mental health. It lays the basis for skill acquisition. It lays the basis for lifelong health and socioeconomic tra trajectories. But at the same time, it's not only the most important period in our time, but it's also the most sensitive period to stress and adversities. And where children are exposed to severe and systematic adversities and they face deficits in nurturing care, the stress starts building up and they start perceiving what's called toxic stress. What's toxic stress? It's the overactivation of different biological systems, including the stress response system. And this is gonna have very profound and maybe life uh, changing consequences. For one, it's gonna affect brain architecture. And this is the figure that you're seeing in your left. In your left. It's highlighting the density and strength of neural connections at different uh, at a specific part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And it's highlighting the density and strength of these networks. And for a child who has been exposed to normal circumstances and one who has been exposed to toxic stress. And you can see very vividly here that when you're when these children are exposed again to systematic adversities and deficits in nurturing care, which lead to toxic stress, you can see that the density is much uh, smaller. You can see that the neural connections are damaged. And this again is gonna affect brain architecture. It's gonna affect the capacity of these children to develop cognitive and social emotional skills. It's gonna affect uh, physical mental health and it's gonna have life altering effects. And this, this work, uh, the, the, the medical doctors who have been uh, studying this um, earlier, and this actually is, a, a, it's called the ACES study in California. Uh, they call it kind of, a, it's reverse alchemy. It's turning gold into lead. We have children that can be gold, that can have successful trajectories. And because of conflict, because of these adversities, their, uh, their possibility of leading healthy, productive, uh, sustainable lives are diminished. So what can we do here? And although we have a large body of work documenting the importance and effectiveness of carefully designed parenting interventions, 
These interventions miss the link between caregiver's mental health and early childhood development. And sometimes they miss the importance of these psychosocial and psychological constraints. And the idea, again, is that the toxic stress emergency emerges when there's a combination of these adversities in combination with lacks of, depth, of nurture and care. But when caregivers are able to build healthy and secure attachments, when they're able to provide this nurture and care, this buffers the psychological effect of stress. And it leads actually to tolerable stress, which is actually important and it's positive because it can create some sense of resiliency. When we look to the science of early child development and we look to interventions of parenting programs, the most important factor for uh, childhood development is actually the, the availability of these nurturing relationships. However, as we highlighted before, the problem is that the capacity of building these nurturing relationships is going to be endogenous to conflict. Why? Because conflict leads to mental health problems, and these mental health problems are actually going to drain the emotional resources, the emotional capacities of these caregivers to connect with their children and to be able to provide this source of stimulating and nurturing environments. And so what I'm highlighting here is that the mental health consequences of, of conflict are actually a binding psychological constraint that we need to pay attention to. And maybe to reinforce uh, this message, let me highlight uh, this with a couple of figures and, and, and one uh, statistical table. Data that we collected from our program, this is highlighting this those response relationships. So we're unplotting the distributions of mental health problems, of mental health in uh, and, uh, and and our study sample. And this figure uh, or more positive uh, uh, number indicates better mental health. And we're stratifying the data according to the severity of conflict, above mean or below mean. And we can highlight here is that those caregivers who had been experiencing more conflict have worse mental health. And then when we look at the quality of the child-parent relationships, the style in the child-parent relationships, for, for instance, uh, when I mean uh, when I refer to style, I'm talking about, uh, for instance, like negative discipline, harsh parenting. What we can see in the top two figures is that caregivers who had mental health problems, their children start experiencing these more insecure and, and more negative child-parent relationships. And this translates in the bottom two figures into worse outcomes in terms of the children's mental health and their development. We have a paper that puts this, puts these figures in, into a little bit more uh, uh, statistical analysis. And what's interesting here is that for some of these children, these effects emerge even though they were not born yet when their caregivers experienced conflict. So this is sort of the intergenerational transmission of poverty and trauma. And what we highlight here uh, in, the, in the red box is that a lot of the effect on children, a lot of the effect of conflict on children is actually mediated or explained by the effect on caregivers' mental health. So what can we do about this? And, and for here, like I, I was kind of portraying a, like a pessimistic uh, a picture of what hap what's happening with children in these settings, but I think there's hope. And in the slides that follow, I'm going to highlight the effects of a psychosocial intervention called semilla de apego, which is, again, like a seed for a healthier attachment that tries to break the intergeneration transmission of poverty and trauma. And what is the program? It's a psychosocial uh, group intervention for caregivers of young children in conflict-affected settings. One objective is to promote maternal mental health and caregiver mental health as an outcome itself but also as a vehicle or as a mechanism to foster the healthy child-parent relationships that can protect children from the negative effects of these adversities and that can lead to healthier and improved early child development. How does it work? It's a group intervention. Uh, groups of 15 to 20 participants meet on a weekly basis, one time per week. Uh, they meet for 15 weeks. So the program has 50 se 15 sessions. And it's also a community model because it's led by paraprofessionals, oftentimes former participants of the program. And this helps us overcome deficits in mental health professionals in these settings. It helps in terms of the cost effectiveness, but it also helps in the way in which these communities are gonna take uh, the program as their own. 
And how does it work? The 15 sessions actually go through a, a similar structure at the, beginning, at, the, at the beginning. There's some stress reduction practice. So we practice with mindfulness that you were he seeing here. We practice with sound salutations, with sensory awareness. Then we go into a main activity that actually switches according to the uh, according to the session. So this is a reflective practice grounded uh, with arts and crafts to ground the information. And this is kind of what you're seeing in the picture. And at the end, there's a group discussion on how do you incorporate the lessons and the reflections of what happened in the session in your daily life. And throughout the 15 weeks, we cover kind of three main or three overarching uh, topics. One is caregiver mental health. Then when we create and we restore these emotional capacities among caregivers, we switch into the child-parent relationships. And then at the end, we try to foster and build and strengthen parenting teams. I don't have time to go into each objective uh, 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 individually, but I just want to highlight one, and it connects with what Catherine was mentioning before. Here in caregivers' mental health, we recognize the capacities that these communities have for resilience. So these are mothers, caregivers who are, are navigating very complex scenarios, who have been exposed to conflict for pretty much all their lives. And within those contexts, they're doing the best and they're being able to protect their children. So they, they do have a lot of resiliency. So we try to foster that resiliency and that goes again to the narrative, to, to the importance of these narratives. We uh, implemented an, an, uh, an impact evaluation in Tumaco in Colombia. This is the municipality that you see in the Southwest of Colombia. It's geographically gorgeous. It's incredible. It's also one of the most violent places in Colombia because it's a natural pathway for drug trades into the Pacific Ocean. It's right in the border with Ecuador. And I can highlight uh, some figures of the vulnerability of the setting. So for instance, Washington DC has a very high homicide rate of 40 homicides per 100,000 uh, 100, uh, inhabitants. It's higher than in Colombia, which we have a homicide rate of 29. Tumaco at the time of the impact evaluation was at 101. It also has very high intensity of displacement that is displayed in the map. And it's also extremely poor. 45% of the population are poor compared to 20% on average in Colombia. And so within the setting, we went and we uh, uh, invited caregivers who have young children served by public early child development centers. And we assigned like a randomized control trial in which some of these caregivers received an invitation to participate in Semilla Pego in addition to the regular services provided by the centers. And this figure plots the point estimates, so the impacts in terms of standard deviations at the one month follow-up. And here we can see that at the one month follow-up, we're not generating any effects on mental health or the quality of the, like the stress and sensitivity in the child-parent relationship. But we do see sizable and important effects in terms of the style and interaction. So. The program actually led to lower uh, harsh parenting. And this is starts uh, translating into uh, improved mental health and development for children. But what's most important is that eight months after the program ended, we went back and we're seeing now sizable, meaningful, and statistically significant effects on caregiver mental health, on the quality and the like lowering the stress and sensitivity in the child parent relationship, and improving mental health and development. And this is interesting because there's a lot of evidence in some of these parenting teams that the effects fade out over time. So we're actually showing that these effects actually build up and become persistent, at least in the short term, eight months after the program ended. And to start wrapping up some uh, additional results. One, and again, going back to Catherine's uh, comment on complementarities, we see that the program actually worked better for caregivers with at-risk mental health. So the program works well for whom it was designed for, but it actually has smaller and sometimes null effects for those families who are in extreme poverty. And this is entirely, I think, intuitive. If, for instance, if we have a family that's food insecure, what's in their mind, it's trying to bring food to the table. It's very difficult in this setting to have them be able to attend the session for 15 weeks and have the emotional capacity to think about the resiliency and so on when they're hungry, right? And so I think this this goes back to Catherine's comment on how do we do this uh, complementarities? How do we do this uh, type of intervention simultaneously? One question that Michael had uh, when we were uh, prepping up for this event is 
So you're highlighting, and, and so the results are highlighting there that we're contributing to breaking the intergenerational transmission of poverty and trauma. But what about the current generation? What's happening with the socioeconomic trajectories of these women and caregivers who participate in the program? This is not something that we had in mind when we designed the impact evaluation, so we don't have the data to test this. We have some anecdotal evidence that actually the psychosocial intervention increased, for instance, uh, the desire of these women to complete high school. Some of them had dropped earlier. They start doing on their own, and although we don't uh, motivate this, they start doing some savings through uh, business, small businesses. But there's actually evidence, uh, there's uh, uh, evidence from Victoria Baranova and co-authors from the Think Equally program in Pakistan that a, uh, that a mental health uh, program focused on uh, perinatal depression actually led to improvements in gender empowerment and socioeconomic outcomes. When we go to the cost effectiveness of our program, just in terms of cost, it's a program that has a high cost. It's $435 per participant, but it's actually lower than that of a similar government program that has no evidence. And when we estimate, and this is preliminary, these are preliminary results, uh, when we estimate the rate of return, we have a high rate of return, even though we're still not accounting the effects for children. And actually based on these positive results, we're, we're scaling up uh, we conducted an implementation science evaluation uh, of an at scale pilot in 2022, and we're currently starting to scale up to reach 15 municipalities and 15,000 caregivers uh, with funding from uh, Hilton Foundation. And so to wrap up, uh, I just want to highlight a couple of uh, points. One, these results speak to the urgency of considering mental health as a psychological constraint in general, but more so in settings of conflict and extreme adversity. Two, recognize that mental health may underlie many dimensions and be a determinant for human capital accumulation and socioeconomic trajectories. And three, we're highlighting that it is possible and much needed to implement evidence-based community psychosocial models in these settings. And this actually connects with some of the things that the USAID is doing with uh, actually partnering with Hilton to do uh, to improve localization of resources and building up these these community-led uh, programs. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Oh. We have uh, one question here. Oh, we'll... Yeah. Thank you so much. I really want to applaud and thank you for bringing uh, focus on these issues to the fore. I would like to take the opportunity to make a really strong plug to make more visible across what you're saying, the specific situations of adolescents and youth. So we're talking about women, we're talking about caregivers, and we're talking about young children. Adolescents, particularly those affected by armed conflict and situations of displacement, are much more likely than younger children and older adults to miss out on education, to be targeted for specific forms of violence and, and, and exploitation, to be forced into roles without the necessary needs, needs or support. They're going through specific physiological and social transition. And, you know, a lot of the work in this field, it has happened tremendously over the decades, and we have wonderful expertise within our own USA job. But I think honing in on the fact that there are some specific life force issues that relate to the approaches that you're talking about with these young people in and out of school, et cetera, and what specifically happens to them is also really important. So I just wanted to flag that, take the opportunity to do that. Um, and again, we have the um, we have Child Protection and Care Learning Network globally. We've got um, our Child Advancement Protection and Care of Children and Adversities Framework, which is evidence-based that our own former Daniel Fufi had worked on. Mm -hmm. We've got our positive youth development framework set for multidisciplinary and evidence based, and this really helps strengthen some of that. It also relates to what we're thinking about in terms of our food security and nutrition goals, how cognition develops, and it really is at the nexus of this work. But we want to keep the visibility. This is more of a statement than a question. Maybe how do you feel about this? I could add. Um, Keep that focus on that transition and yep. what that means, and and, and create that space also for young people to be seen and heard. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so thank you so much uh, well, uh, for your intervention. So what was being discussed, is it's, it's highlighting uh, one, the specific focus on what's happening with adolescents. So, and actually adolescence is uh, 
so so I talked about early childhood development as, as being the most important stage in life. Adolescent is maybe the other one, right? And and what we're seeing in the program is actually that we have some adolescent uh, mothers who are then kind of uh, experiencing a lot of changes on their own and having to have a, 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 a take care of very young children at a very early age. And so we we so uh, again the question was like or the comment was like well we need to highlight this and we need to highlight and and I agree with you also that things are being done and we're seeing a lot of like new evidence coming in and evidence actually motivating uh, a lot of these uh, type of interventions and some evidence coming from these settings like Colombia but also evidence that have that has been happening here in the U.S. for a while the we started and, and became inspired by the child parent psychotherapy program that was developed by UCSF, uh, the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, there's also the ABCD uh, program in, in the US. And what we're highlighting is that the accumulation of knowledge with expertise in the field and working with these communities can actually help us better identify the needs, characteristics, and strengths of these, of these uh, communities and how we can actually turn the tide to empower them. Thank you so much, Andres. I've got two uh, questions from online. The first one is from a BHA colleague. That's our Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. He's based here in Washington, but we have a big program in Colombia helping the Venezuela response. He says, what is the scope for integrating Semillas de Pego, if I'm saying that wrong, no, no. type activities into other programming and other settings, complex emergencies where BHA implements so much activity? Should I give you the second one now? The second one is from Steve Butcher um, to Andres. It seems that Samia Diego is targeted exclusively to female caregivers. Is that correct? And so why? Yeah. So let uh, thank you. So let me start with the second question. Uh, so it, it's not uh, we we actually target primary caregivers, uh, and this can be the father or the mother. But it turns out, or actually sometimes the grandmother. The picture here is actually a grandmother of this of those young children. This is in Tumaco. Uh, but it turns out that 90% of our participants are women, 85 are the mothers. But over time, what we're seeing in the communities where we work is that it starts changing. And this is something that we want to evaluate more rigorously. It starts changing like norms around parenting. So for some of the well, first uh, male participants, they were actually being bullied in the community. Why are you going to a women's group? What's happening with you? What's wrong with you? Right. And now over time, we're seeing more fathers taking the step to try to participate. And the rates in the last two cohorts, I think it's actually 20% of fathers, 80% mothers. So, uh, because again, biologically, what matters is the relationship with, with the, between the child and an adult, and this can be anybody. Uh, and the second question, uh, yeah, so thank you. We've been actually discussing, and uh, last uh, two weeks ago, we had a big uh, convening by Hilton, and all the partners of Hilton in, in Colombia and Ecuador. And we've been discussing ways in which we can actually uh, uh, complement the type of work that we do with some of the things that, uh, that are being done in the field. And, and again, Colombia is uh, interesting because it has a lot of support, a lot of resources that are coming in. A lot of resources that are actually coming in because of the Venezuelan refugee crisis. Uh, and although this program was not designed specifically for Venezuelans, we started this uh, 10, 11 years ago, fo focusing on displaced persons. We're now opening the scope for including Venezuelan refugees. And we see the scope for these complementarities uh, between other programs. Yep. Thank you so much. Do we have another question in the room? Are we, yes, can I do one more? Can you actually do it in the microphone next to uh... Andre, because the people online have a hard time hearing this money. Uh, so first off, thank you for coming to speak with us today. Uh, one of the really interesting findings you mentioned was that the uh, result of the program was less effective for uh, families who encountered extreme poverty. And I guess my question with regard to that is, does that sort of evidence that children's brains develop differently when they experience families that come from conflict areas? Or um, is it, do they develop differently when um, they encounter families that come from more extreme uh, poverty situations? And does that evidence that um, there should be a change in programming? Or is it more so uh, evidence that children's brains are developing differently. Yeah, so great. Thank you. Uh, great question. Thank you. 
So, so I think this is highlighting how uh, children's brain and mental health and, and, and physical health is very susceptible to these adversities uh, and how these adversities not only affect these children, but their families. And so I think it's, it's telling us something about programming that we need to, again, pay more attention and think about all the work that has been done uh, and all the evidence that we have so that we can better protect these families so that they can kind of have the, their, capacity, their biological capacities to take care of their children. So of course, uh, a, a young child that is uh, not fed is gonna have like high rates of, of malnutrition and so on. And we know then we've been, uh, there's a lot of evidence about this, but this is highlighting maybe a different scope in which the adversities also affect the caregiver and whether it's conflict that affects the caregiver and makes them relatively, it hinders their capacity to take care of further children, but also these extreme socioeconomic adversities, again, how do you think, how do you navigate when you're bring, thinking about bringing food to the table on a daily basis? Those adversities also matter for the caregiver. So this is kind of thinking about this dual generation type of programming that we need to, okay, we need to take care of children, but to be able to take care of children, we need to take care of their caregivers or empower, not take care, but empower their caregivers to be better able to take care of them. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andres. And I can do a view from the chart. Yeah, I'm just doing it. Um, slideshow. Let's do that. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, the, the last session, I, the last point that I wanted to make for this, and sorry to go through it all again, um, is that I we've seen some great examples um, of ways that you can uh, do psychosocial programming that's more intensive, but I also don't want to scare anyone away, scare anyone away, and I want to emphasize that you can do psychosocial programming um, and very light touch to more intensive ways. So you can embed some of the things that we were talking about in those best bets and um, for boosting aspirations and agency more broadly through program communication. So that's changing narratives, con conveying to participants um, that you see them as capable and resourceful. That can be in flyers, mission statements, uh, scripts that you say to people, SMS texts. Um, these role models can be conveyed in media and in films, um, as well as actually the practice of visualization and goal setting. You can do brief guided discussions with communities like what I showed you in Niger. And they can be community discussions, small groups, or one-on-one -on -one sessions with individuals to prompt um, visualization and, and goal setting. Um, these same topics can be addressed in self-guided exercises that you can do through WhatsApp chatbots or Facebook Messenger um, or SMS or IVR. Lots of different um, uh, strategies for uh, engaging individuals in those self-guided exercises. And then finally, these more intensive in-person trainings you can do to add life skills trainings or um, more intensive psychosocial interventions, mental health interventions as a program add-on. It's a component that you can add on to multifaceted programs. So I didn't want to scare you away. I wanted to leave you with a kind of optimistic note that I think that these can be integrated readily into existing programs. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Um, okay, do we have any questions online that uh, we'd like? Um, Catherine, at the end of your session, you had, um, what did you call it, a pitfall or a pain point? You talked about how with some of these very specific interventions, I think you had Togo, Rwanda, Kenya, um, it actually, I think what I saw up there was that it actually hurts to have it be too culturally specific, these types of interventions, because then they can become stigma reinforcing. Um, so it was a pitfall at the end of your session, and it said, don't tailor to socioeconomic context and cultural context too much. And I think I saw, no, I misunderstood. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry if I 
no, no, no. I, I Maybe there's a typo or something, yeah. but it's the opposite. the opposite. I'm a cultural and social psychologist. And what we generally find is that matching people's values can um, reduce the cognitive dissonance that they might feel, as Rashid was saying yesterday, between being urged to adopt a new behavior and their values. Those don't need to be in conflict. And so you always want to make programs more culturally attuned um, and related to people's values to achieve that alignment. Okay, so we are all USA staff online in the room. How do we do something then that's specific to that community that is culturally specific enough? Because even in Mozambique or Madagascar, you have very different cultural context. There's not a one size fits all even for a country. So that for a USA mission is challenging mm -hmm. to get it right. And mm -hmm. we often are afraid of getting it wrong, mm -hmm. which leads to paralysis right. of action. Literally got this question earlier this morning. Ready. Okay. So the general gist is that um, I think you should start from a place of interdependence rather than independence. The West is notoriously atypical of the global population and being very individual individualistically focused. So we should just, I don't think that is best practice as a default for entering global South lower income context, because interdependence is associated both with, um, has been found more um, common in non-Western context and in lower income settings within Western context. So I would definitely start from a place of interdependence. Now the question is, what form does that interdependence take? And I have two suggestions for very practical ways to think about this. First, you can ask people about what values they want to convey to their children. And that suggests, you know, what, what they want, they hope to pass along, what they hope their children to grow up with. That can tell you about what their foundational values are, and you want to reflect those values in program narratives and and programming in general. Um, and then the second way is thinking about mental models. So for instance, I asked women in Niger, what do you think um, drives women's economic success here? And I actually give them four quantitative um, uh, variables and ask them to rank them. Um, so it's like self-initiative, hard work, um, respecting others, and peacefulness, which is kind of social and inner harmony. And we find that they predict that peacefulness and working well with others is much more important than self-initiative and hard work, whereas we find when predictions from the U.S., it's the opposite. So asking people, and we also find that, you know, not having tension in the household, not having conflict in the household is also seen as very important for women's economic success. So if you can do qualitative research to understand mental models, and then ideally translate that into a quantitative question and ask it more broadly and ask people to rank factors that, that have emerged from that qualitative research, then you can build in those mental models what people see as useful and functional in their context into the design of the program. So those would be my two recommendations. Great. I think I saw there that you have a paper coming out on this. Yes, I do. Well, I have a paper already on that point okay. that's out. Um, and then another paper on directly comparing more personal initiative to interpersonal initiative. So mm -hmm. thank you for the question. Okay, do you have any other questions from the room or online? Yes, we do. Oh, there we go. John, do you want to come up and stand at the podium? If we're, for our online people, we have like 60, 80 people on our There was a question from Jennifer Carson. So, yeah. yeah, thanks. I'm John Meyer from the Center for Resilience. Another question for Catherine. Uh, in your presentation, there was there was a bar graph with four uh, kind of vertical bars. I think the, uh, um, the uh, variable was consumption. You recall that one? Uh, I was curious, uh, and it, there seemed to be a small but significant difference among treatments in that case. Um, did you look at cost at all, and to see how much it costs to to uh, you know have some incremental improvement by adding some added feature? Well, so what we have is an overall measure. Thank you for the question. I guess everybody heard it is about cost effectiveness. Um, and we do have relative cost effectiveness of those four arms on consumption exactly. So it actually doesn't even include other economic benefits like assets or um, any other indicators. So it's just on consumption. On that measure alone, we find that that psychosocial condition um, does achieve the highest benefit to cost ratio and it's higher. The full condition, which, achieve, which includes both the capital package, the capital cash grant, as well as those two psychosocial interventions, it's significantly the cost effectiveness is significantly greater than the cash grant based condition, the capital package, which suggests that there's a marginal benefit 
in terms of cost effectiveness for adding those two psychosocial interventions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have another arm that just had a psychosocial intervention. So we can't speak exactly to that question, but I would point you, so in the paper, we go into that in more detail. And I'd also point you to a paper that just came out by Kate Orkin and colleagues on aspirations, comparing aspirations interventions like that one to cash transfers in Kenya, where she, um, where they directly compare cost effectiveness of just the psychosocial interventions to the cash. So thank you for the question. Are my questions or? Yeah, can we invite Jennifer Karsner to come off um, mute? Jennifer, I believe you can. All right, um, I'll go ahead and lower my hand. Yeah, so we had really positive experience with ethnographic research conducted in Niger that specifically looked at what do women want? And traditionally, the value of a woman in society, this was uh, was around a woman who had agricultural surplus and then gave it out, had very high status, almost equal to that um, of that of a man. But over generations, as the land availability hugely decreased and women, they the culture realized it was simply not possible for a woman who was typically only given 5% of her husband's land to work on. Agricultural productivity was no longer a reasonable expectation. Um, it switched to a tambare, which is a high status woman with somebody who was educated. And we, um, so that was what our ethnographic research came out. And that was kind of late in the program, but that explained, I believe, um, so much about why our women's literacy programs were so successful, not only um, but like when you went in there, the self-confidence and the, uh, the feeling of the women who had participated in those interventions was immediately evident in person. And it also, I think, explains why that was one of the few things they chose to use their own money to continue was because we were directly programming to something that gave them status within their own cultural understanding. And so, you know, some of us have been really trying to kind of evangelize un understanding the dynamics of social prestige and status because it really has made a, a difference. Um, it was also uh, a girl's participation in school was a culturally acceptable way to delay early marriage. So if we could just promote girls schooling, which was well received, as opposed to saying, don't marry them yet, which was not well received, then you know, tr trying to work within those cultural values made, made a huge difference, um, over. I am so glad that you just brought that up, Jennifer. Um, we that's exactly status social status i find is the most predictive variable of well-being of women's well-being in this context um and that's exactly what we found in our research and so and that's what we tried to build into the intervention this prestige um and not only that i'm finding that across multiple studies that status which is measured by macarthur's social status which includes both education and jobs so um to your point on whether you know it's economic or education we we bundle those together in the MacArthur social status ladder, um, that that is the most predictive of well-being in Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, and several other places. So I think that's a very relevant variable, not only in Niger, but most likely um, in West and East Africa more broadly. Um, and, you know, I found that women's control over decision-making, not that that's a problem at all, it just wasn't predictive of women's well-being. So I think that we should be focusing in the domain of gender equality and women's empowerment. We should be focusing much more on status um, than we currently are. That's not even in our indicators often. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for bringing that up and sharing that research. Uh, well, we're in our break time, but I think, is there, there's a buzzer line? Oh, I'll have one more. Okay. Will you come to the podium? You oh, yeah, sure. So Alejandro Valencia, I'm here with USAID, with the REFS Bureau. So my question is for Andres. Um, really interesting uh, work that you're doing. Um, so you're talking about uh, displaced populations that are, you know, assume, I'm assuming coming to the cities. Um, Colombia has had, until very recently, like the biggest numbers of, of displaced populations internally. Um, so I'm wondering, you talk about the, the concept of I think it's like toxic versus more manageable um, the status. And I'm wondering because when you when you go into these these places where the displaced people live, even within the cities, it, there's still a lot of of this violence, a lot of these stressors, you would think. So I'm I'm wondering if if you found any like point of time that sort of 
tells you like that change between those two um, mental states or, or, or stressor states. Um, I mean, just very anecdotal data. Uh, growing up in Colombia, I, I, I saw a lot of these like uh, people that have migrated that eventually do uh, come to a to a different uh, way of living, but they still have a lot of these stressors. So I'm wondering, you know, if there's any difference basically between the rural places where they're living versus the city, and now with the migration uh, from from Venezuela, if you know all the people that are coming to Colombia eventually do see some of the the, the stress reduction, or or they continue to live like this, just in a different setting. Thanks. Thank you, Alejandro. Great questions. So uh, what, what we actually see, I think, in general, is so, so we actually don't talk about PTSD, like post-traumatic stress disorder, but rather about a complex trauma because some of these uh, uh, populations are actually migrating or being displaced by conflict from rural areas, but re arriving to cities, they set up in the outskirts of the cities uh, where there is still a lot of things happening, a lot of, a lot of exposure to trauma. And when we actually started the, the impact evaluation in Tumaco, this was right around, uh, right after the peace process was signed. Tumaco at that moment, uh, when we went to see the field, there was kind of a, a, a setting of what we thought was going to be post-conflict. And so we were thinking, well, this is going to be a post-conflict type of intervention. When we started the impact evaluation, conflict arose. And so we started picking up that it was actually, that conflicts was still happening. And we had a question on, well, Will the intervention work here, given this type of setting where there's like a lot of bad things happening, right? Uh, and again, this takes it to the point, the, the, the original intervention, which inspired us, was developed uh, by UCSF for Afro-American and Latino communities in California that were post-adversities, right? And so, and so I think it, it, this brings a question that, that in these settings, it's, you still have an accumulation of, of adverse events. And traumatic events, but what this is highlighting is that uh is that these carefully designed interventions can actually create the sense of resiliency, and the capacity for emotional regulation for these communities to better navigate these circumstances. Of course, what we would like is for conflict to go right, uh, but I think as you mentioned, even for those communities that have been displaced ten years, twenty years ago, you still see kind of the persistence of some of these symptoms. And the persistence of some of these these effects, again, kind of the some of the figures that I highlighted was even for children who were born after the conflict, they're still affected and directly through the, what's happening with their mothers. So that's one part of the story. And maybe just to to highlight, we we also have data on Venezuelan refugees. We actually have a study in Venezuelan children and adolescents in Medellin. It's a representative survey, and to our surprise, we're not seeing. Uh, that like higher levels of psychological trauma among Venezuelan refugees compared to Colombians. But I think this is because in general in Colombia and in some of these places where they coexist, mental health problems are actually higher. And so we do see that for the different types of population, internally displaced populations, conflict affected populations, Venezuelan refugees, we see that it's a, it's, there's a need and a priority to think harder about mental health. Thank you. 